Hello. <coughs> uh, hi, guys. The microphone works, so we'll make use of it, even if it's not necessary. <laughs> so um, this uh, now, uh, welcome to our surprise talk. Uh, instead of the lightning talks, we'll have Andrew Poor from Google talking about, about democratization of user research. research. <laughs> so, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah. So uh, welcome, Andrew Poor. Thank you. So what the hell does that even mean? The democratization of user research, right? It's like it's kind of a cool catchphrase. It's got a bunch of buzzwords in it. But what? Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about it, right? To sum up like the next 20 minutes in like 30 seconds, to me, the democratization of user research really means that we're all researchers. And I'll kind of go into why I believe that and why I think we should do research and what research even is and what value it brings. And then some trips and ticks on trips, <laughs> tricks and tips on how to do it. So. Oh, I guess I skipped over who I am. I'm Andrew Puel. I'm a researcher at Google. I work on the Google Cloud Platform. Um, I've been a designer and a researcher for the better part of a decade now. Um, and why I like being a researcher is I like asking the question why. And I like kind of hearing the stories behind it. Um, now, to me, research is really about building empathy and understanding those people um, or the people that are using our end products, right? And Jess's talk earlier kind of touched on this, why it's important to understand that. Um, David Kelly, one of the co-founders of IDEO, says the main tenet of design thinking is empathy for the people you're trying to design for. And I think this is critical. Um, kind of that next segue is I work with a guy named Miles Orkin. I highly recommend like searching his name. He's got some really cool talks out there. But he has this belief that we are all designers, right? So is anyone in the UX field here? Is anyone like a designer interaction? Yes, that's cool. Um, no one else. What does everyone else do? You guys engineers, like developers, front end, back end, yeah? yeah? PMs maybe? OK. But we all make things, right? Whether it's code or interaction models or user flows, we all make things. And Miles' belief, and I prescribe to this, is that since we all make things, that makes us all designers. We don't have to have the word designer in our title to consider ourselves designers. And I think this is a really important notion to keep in mind when we're making our products and taking into consideration what we're making. Now, from my experience, right, so I've got this belief where I believe that we are all designers. But from my experiences, everybody is talking to users when we're making products, right? This could be in chat boards. Oh, sorry, um, this could be in. Um, like in online forums, email, over the phone, via webcasts, um, even via trouble tickets, right? We, there is a, f a format for us to engage with the people that are ultimately using the products that we're building. And I think this is great, right? So I was telling somebody earlier that I finally learned how to put memes and uh, GIFs into my presentation, so we're going to try to keep it entertaining. Um, so this is great, though. Data is prevalent. It's everywhere, and we're all collecting it. And that's really important, and I don't want to over, I don't want to overgloss on that or neglect that. Um, and I think we need to continue to do this. But the one thing that I think we need to be cognizant of and that we need to try to maybe over-index on is instead of talking to our users, let's try listening to them a little bit more. And when we listen to users, we can start to empathize with them. We can put ourselves in their shoes. We can try to feel the world as they feel it, feel their pain with the products that they're using. All right, so if everyone's talking to people, who the hell are these people, right? So there's, you know, there's all these cool job titles up there, right? User researcher, user experience researcher, design researcher, data analyst, market researcher, qualitative, quantitative, ethnographer, digital anthropologist. These are all really just cool titles for people whose job it is to talk and listen to our users. And this is what I do, right? This is why I exist. Um, and you know, sometimes we listen to users for five minutes. It could be an hour, could be a day, or it could be through the lifespan of our product. Okay, so we're all talking to users, at least that's my, my belief, and we're all designers. And then there's these people called researchers. And I'm advocating that we're all researchers, right? And that we should do research, but why? Why should we do research? Why not just talk to users? If we're already doing that, why don't we just stick with that, right? It's easier, less work. So let's go over some of the reasons why not to do research, right? These are fun. That's expensive, maybe. I don't know. I try not to pay for it. Um, too many resources. 
it, it, it's possible, right? You know, there's just this person like me who goes off and listens to people. That, that could be too much. Unclear value, that's a reason not to do something. If we're unsure what we're going to get out of it, that might be a reason not to do something. It's scary. God, I love hearing this from people. I don't know what my users are going to say. That's terrifying. I'm afraid of what they're going to say. It's time-consuming. It, it can be, right? It, sometimes research takes months, takes years, right? But it doesn't have to. So let's keep that in perspective. It's not my job. Right? This is a great one. Um, but this is my all-time favorite. Some of my PM colleagues in the past have told me this. I know what my users want. I am my user, and I know what they want. So why would I do research if I know what they want? OK, so we got that out of the way. So why should we do research, right? Well, one of the reasons is we can answer questions with data, right? That's a, that's a good reason to do research. Another is when doing focused user research, we can start to uncover opportunities that may have been un unaware to us prior to doing that research, right? We might capture an insight from watching or observing someone that we didn't know. We can find a workaround that they're currently using that we can design for to solve that problem. It can save time, right? It takes time, but it can save time in the long run. That's another good reason. Uh, kind of tying back to those new opportunities, it also brings clarity to the decision-making process. Um, jumping across the screen, it aligns project stakeholders. These two come together really well. Focused user research really helps us, since we're all talking to users, right? And we're all collecting this data, and we've got it coming everywhere. Historically, from my perspective, that's happening in silos. Project managers are talking to users. Engineers are talking to another set of users. Sales and marketing are talking to different groups of users. And focus user research allows us to bring these questions that everyone's asking and bringing it into one cohesive plan. It saves money. And kind of going into that, we know when to launch. Another good reason, right? We can do usability testing and understand when a product meets a certain threshold and when it's acceptable to put it out in the market, or when our users are satisfied and delighted by the product that we've created. But ultimately, tying back to my original point, it builds empathy. As we start to listen to our users again, we get to understand what their life is like and how we can try to walk that mile in their shoes. All right, so kind of my little play on words. So back to Miles' thought of everyone being designers and design with a little r. I believe since we are all designers, we all are researchers, and we should all be going out and doing research when we're building the products that we're building. Now, at Google, we have these 10 core values, right? These are kind of like the principles behind our company. They're public. You can go and search them and see them. But the very first one is focus on the user, and all else will follow. Now, if you look at Amazon, they have uh, a similar list of principles. They call them leadership principles. And their first one is customer obsession. Start with the customer and work backwards, right? Now, these are cool buzz terms, and companies all around the world have these. Um, oops, wow, I didn't expect that to happen. But what does that mean, right? Well, companies actually believe that we should understand what our users think, right? These are, these are the foundational building blocks of why these companies exist and why they've been successful. And if we're focusing on our user, research is a way to do that. And it's a structured way to go and understand their needs. All right. Daniel Pink is a behavioral economist. He's written a bunch of really cool books. Um, but he's got this quote that I really like, that empathy is about standing in someone else's shoes. I've kind of said this a few times. Feeling with his or her heart, seeing with his or her eyes. Not only is empathy hard to outsource and automate, but it makes the world a better place. And I believe that. And I believe that if we can understand our users and their wants and their needs and their pain points, that we can actually build products that will make their life better. And ultimately, that just gets passed I know it seems idealistic, but it's at least what I believe. All right. So to me, research is all about building empathy, right? And user research isn't simply about methods or even like looking at the data that we collect, right? To me, when looking at someone whose job title might be a researcher or who might have research training, their strong suit is their ability to synthesize the data that they've collected. And this could be from one study or from multiple studies. And develop a point of view based on that data, as well as data they've encountered in the past. Now, my research colleagues are like, Andrew, you are crazy. You should not advocate that everyone should do research. I will not have a job. I disagree with that, right? I totally disagree with that. And this is why. I think what separates a trained researcher 
from someone who's just talking to users is the ability to control and limit bias in their research. So not influencing what the person says or influencing the way we analyze data. And coming up, I've got some tips, man, I'm really struggling with words today, tricks and tips on how to kind of do that. All right, this is my, yeah, right, it's cool, right? Um, I spent hours on a plane ride trying to figure out how to put GIFs into my presentation. Um, there's like 300 people at Google who think I'm an idiot. Um, they probably wish they were part of hiring me. Um, yeah, this, I, sorry. Uh, but listening, right, that's the first step, right? If we can focus on listening to your users, it gives us that opportunity to put ourselves in their shoes. And it gives us that opportunity to build empathy with them. All right, so how? Right? This is cool. I just rambled for 12 minutes about empathy and listening and research and why to do something or why not. But how? All right, so let's think about the product creation life cycle, right? Now, my colleagues in PM uh, think this is an extreme simplification, and they like to make fun of me for it, but let's just assume there's three main phases to building a product, right? So we start with the product vision. Then from there, after we work on that for a bit, we kind of get it down into features, right? So like things, what they may do or what they may not do. Uh, and then flows, right? The concrete steps that somebody has to go through to achieve that goal that may have been set out with the features. And when we start to think about this gross generalization of the product development cycle, we can start to think about where research fits in. All right, so quickly, let's, let's leave or let's think about three main types of research, right? So we've got foundational research, and this is typically done in the beginning, so when looking at product vision, these help us answer questions like, who are my users? What are they doing? How many of them are there? Why do they want this, right? Uh, and that, when we start to collect that data, it really kind of gives us an idea of what we're building, why we're building it, what problems we're trying to solve. And as we start to move down, right, and we started to answer those questions, and we start thinking about the features or the goals that users may have, we can start to look at concept testing, right? So do users like the goal that we're trying to solve? Do they like the way that we're going about it? Uh, and this is really helpful um, because as we start to develop these features, this concept testing helps us validate these features with users and make sure it's meeting their needs and desires and that the product is on course to delight, right? And it's hopefully what we're all out to do to make a delightful product for our users. And it's also helpful because if we've realized we're off course, it gives us time to kind of correct that deviation and avoid any costly missteps. It's a lot easier to, do some, to uh, rework something here than it is when we're at the fine details and when we're at the flow level. Now, as these features get baked uh, and we start to move into the finer details, a value of testing or usability testing um, allows us to make sure that those interactions and micro interactions we've created um, are successful uh, and that they match to our users' micro, uh, the mental models, and what their expectations are. I wish I could see all of this. Oh, yeah, there we go. Um, and in terms of looking at those user flows, um, we can measure to see how successful they are um, by looking at heuristics or even success criteria. And we can measure this across time, right? So if we do four or five usability studies at this stage in the, the product development process, we can measure our success along the way. Um, and if you're looking for success criteria, Google created a framework called the Heart Framework. Uh, it's really helpful in kind of trying to determine what success for a product could look like and how to measure it. All right, gift number two. So how do I do it, right? So I just talked about these different types of research. I talked about all the reasons why I think we should do research. Um, but really, just like anything in life, practice makes perfect, right? Research is similar to cooking in the fact that we have a recipe, right? We can have a research plan, but every time we go and listen to a user or ask them questions and then start listening to them, that session or that time with that user is going to be different from the next one, right? So we need to be nimble on our feet, and we just need to keep doing this over and over to kind of get more practice with it. All right, awesome. So I'm going to quickly fly through these. So when we go into these steps, let's try to take a growth mindset into this, right? Let's all understand that we're maybe not perfect at this. Maybe this is our first time trying this, and that's okay, right? All right. Listen, right? I've said this like 15 times, um, but this is one of the core principles of doing user research. Um, and if you need help trying to actually focusing on listening and not talking, um, 
Spend your time, instead of taking notes, writing down absolutely everything somebody's saying, focus on writing down just the key phrases and the questions you want to ask them um, to follow up on. I encourage you to have like a colleague or a friend to actually try to transcribe the session and take notes for you, and that'll give you that time and space to be able to listen to what the person's saying. So just some quick tricks and tips. I don't really like to think of them do's and don'ts, more like helpful guidelines. Um, Go in with a beginner's mindset, right? Even though you may have heard something three or four times, you may be getting a different flavor in this session when somebody's spoken time, uh, spending time with you. Also, it's a conversation, right? It's not about just like a call and response, right? This is meant to be a dialogue. And a trick that I like to use a lot is don't be afraid to paraphrase what the person said, right? And this is really helpful because one, it slows the session down. Uh, but two, it gives you the opportunity to confirm that what they said and what you heard are the same thing. All right, my, my next tip, keep your heads up and your eyes open. I recently got hit by a car on a bike. Um, I'm okay, the bike's not okay. Um, but it's kind of like riding a bike in the city, right? You really need to keep your heads up, you need to observe what's going on, you need to follow the flow, and you need to be able to course correct if you need, if you need to make changes. Uh, yeah. So, focus on observing what users are doing. Ask them to show you how they perform their day-to-day -day tasks, right? This is another helpful tip. Um, if you notice any offline processes or workarounds that people are created, dive into that. That's an area of opportunity that we can try to solve for an unmet need. And another really helpful tip is watching for tones, right? Or people's facial expressions or body expressions. People say things, but they may mean something completely else. And when we start to look at these secondary cues, it's a way for us to tie into that and try to understand that. Um, as well as looking for patterns and inconsistencies uh, to what I was saying between what people are saying and what people are actually doing. All right, stay curious, right? This is another really useful thing when engaging with our users and trying to do some basic level research. Um, yeah, so curiosity may have killed the cat, but it definitely keeps the researcher employed. Um, yeah. So don't be afraid to ask questions, right? Um, like why, you can never ask why too many times. Um, it, it, it's super useful. It's pretty much the question I ask after somebody says something. Um, and also treat the other four W's and an H, uh, the who, what, where, when, and how, as your best friends, right? These are ways to kind of follow up on what people are saying and dive into them. And even if you think you already know the answer, or somebody's showing you something, you're like, ah, I know what they're gonna do next, I've seen this 10 times, ask them why anyways, right? Because they may have a different reason as to why they've done it. Also, ask about past experiences rather than future predictions, right? We want to understand how people are doing things, um, not necessarily like the way they think they may do it in the future. Now, at the end of a session, we can focus on like what an ideal state would be or what the future may look for them, but when we're going through flows, let's really try to focus on how they're actually doing it. All right, dive in, immerse yourself. So th these are just some like ways to kind of think about phrasing something. So, Use prompts that encourage users to tell stories, right? I mentioned earlier that why I'm a researcher is I like to ask why and hear the stories behind them. So a way to think about that is, tell me how you got into your role, or tell me why you got into school, into this field. Um, and kind of tangentially to this, we want to solicit examples from people, right? Uh, so a way of thinking about this is give me an example of a time when you got frustrated with that tool, or give me an example of how this worked the last time you used it. Um, and tying back into that, also ask for a guided tour, right? So having people show you what they actually do. I don't just have them explain it to you, but have them walk you through it step by step. Um, something that maybe try to avoid is asking how would you improve the product, right? That's a pretty like bland question, but if we think about rephrasing that as what makes this task challenging, we can start to get at the problems instead of just a hypothetical solution. Or another way of that is what aspects of this task are wasteful? Boy, this is something that I haven't abided by. Silence is okay. I've just been rambling for 25 minutes. Uh, this is great. Um, yeah, so I, I won't even talk about these, but it's okay to be quiet, right? Um, it's okay for there to be silence, to give the user a time to think about what they were saying. Yeah. Uh, feel the pain, right? So we really want to try to put ourselves in their shoes. We want to keep ourselves small in the relationship. So in the beginning, I usually try to spend a few minutes letting them know that I'm there to listen, and I want to make the session as safe and comfortable as possible for them. Yeah, so does anyone work with a researcher? I should have asked that in the beginning. No? Yes, cool. Um, 
Yeah, well, hopefully at some point in your life you will. Um, but now, even though that you're not, you should get out and do research, right? I'm happy to share these tricks and tips as well as some like other documents that have been created over the years. Um, but when you do get to work with a researcher, please don't like ignore what they said for what I said. Um, they'll be really upset. Um, so yeah, cool, awesome. Well, thanks. Thank you. Does anyone have any questions? Oh yeah. What's up? Oh, wow, that's a whole completely different question. That's like a market research question, so I'd like to leave that to somebody else. Uh, no, 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 I'm joking. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but the question was, how do we like divide or focus on which part of the discrepancy for what somebody says they want versus what they're willing to pay? Uh, boy, that's not the question I was expecting to get. Um, that's okay. Um, let's talk about this offline. How's that sound? Yeah, cool, awesome. Uh, that's probably not what anyone else wanted to hear, but sorry, I need to think about that one a little bit longer. Does anyone else have any questions? No? Cool, awesome. Well, I think it was quite an interesting talk, and uh, I believe many of the concepts you can really apply to real life about empathy, guys, like just saying. <laughs> so thank you very much, yeah. Andrew. It was quite insightful. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh, did I turn it off? No, I guess I didn't. No, no, no. You, ah. you just press it long. Oh, you just hold it? Yeah. Boy, I wouldn't have guessed.